Hello, Neil. It's lovely to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to chat to me today. It's a pleasure. Well, I'm really excited to be speaking to you about Reading Between the Lines, which is the fabulous new podcast from The People's Friend. Now, Neil, you've recorded the podcast theme tune for us, which is a new version of a song that was first published in The Friend in 1905. Mm. That was only a few years into the Edwardian era. What did you think when we first got in touch and suggested this project to you? And had you even heard of The People's Friend? (laughs) <laughs> I'd certainly heard of The People's Friend, yes. I've known about The People's Friend all my life, I think. Um, and the song, it was it fascinated me because, obviously, a lot of my work with early film takes place in the Edwardian era. So I'm, although I'm less used to the music of that period, I know a lot about the period itself and about the attitudes and the moors and so forth. Um, and when the song came through, uh, when I got the the dots, as we say, the uh, the style of it seemed absolutely lovely. It was very jaunty. It was very much of its time. And kind of interesting that, am I right in thinking this was a winning song from a competition? Or had they actually commissioned the song? Do you know? Uh, Yes, we do know. Um, We've got a fantastic archives department who have actually dug back into the archives for us and and found out the story behind the song. So um, what they did in the magazine was they offered a prize of one guinea for somebody to write a song, which was to be the best song addressed to the people's friend. And interestingly, maybe it's it's not interesting, but it it was to me, they asked for the lyrics first. Ah. So they awarded the prize for the lyrics Um, which was to this song, The Dear Old People's Friend, um, Mm. written by Charles Cunningham of Clyde Bank. Mm -hmm. And then they printed the lyrics in the magazine and they asked for a second person to write the tune to go with them. And they offered Ah. a further guinea as a prize for a tune, which was written by a Mr. Arthur Arthur Harold of Glasgow. Um, Ah, And the editor at the time, I noticed that you said it was quite jaunty. The editor at the time said, it certainly does not fail in breeziness and vigour, and we think it ought to sing well. So um, (laughs) I'm not sure they had sung it at that point, but um, it certainly does have breeziness and vigour. It does. (laughs) It's close to a music hall song without having that genre's vulgarities, if I may. It's a rather more polite version of a music hall song. It's very much um, in the kind of four-square style of Edwardian music. So that... uh, Not far off Gilbert and Sullivan, basically. Hmm. But with a very singable feel to it. And I suspect this is why the, the music was was chosen to go with the words, either because at some stage or other somebody did actually sing it. I don't know whether the people's friend has such a thing as an AGM or had in 1904, but they whether someone might have actually sung the song in public or whether they were hoping that their readership, because I assume that music was available, that their readership would actually sing it themselves. So they would actually get, they'd, you know, particularly aimed, as I can see, very much at Scots all around the world and this whole idea of Scotland still being alive in their hearts and that the People's Friend, re- you know, obviously representing that, that this would be something that a Scots community would like to hear. So I assume that its singability was part of the prize-winning element of it and that the way that it was written uh, it's not difficult music, so it's quite simple to kind of to, to hear where the tune's going. There's a couple of nice little sort of jumps in the music so that it's, it's not too predictable. But I could hear, and I think I mentioned to Chris when I sent it back to him, that if you were going to get it sung, and forgive me for going down the sort of um, uh, the, the, the Andy Stewart lane but it's that kind of feeling of uh, a fairly muscular enthusiastic scots baritone and if someone sang that song in that style that would fit exactly so i can imagine that it was intended for singing it was intended to be part of a community experience 
It's a lovely image in my head as you were speaking of um, DC Thompson himself and the other board members singing the, the People's <laughs> Friends song around the board table, which is a lovely, lovely image. Um, I don't know if um, if People's Friend uh, team members ever did actually sing the song. When I started in the People's Friend in the 1990s, the song was talked about um, and the perceived wisdom at the time was... Oh, we have this song in our archives. It was written for the People's Friend. It's not actually that good. Mm. So that that was always what people said without, as far as I know, ever having tried to play it or sing it themselves. So what a lovely surprise I had when I heard your <laughs> version. And I actually thought, this this is fantastic. I love it. So oh, Well, that's that's very nice. I have to say, you've, you've just uh, put into words the experience I've had as a silent film pianist all my life which was people saying, why do you do this job? The films aren't that good. Actually, the films are brilliant. And all you need to do is try and accept that they're from a time and a place that could not be a more different country to the one that we're living in now. And once you accept those things, actually, it's got a quite a lot going for it. And I do think it's it's a sweet little song. It would be very much a kind of curio if you were to sing it now. but for us, and I think this is something to do with being in the 21st century, looking back quite as far as this, I think it carries with it a charm that is a bit of a time capsule. I think this is the way people thought. It's the way they put their ideas into words. It represents something of that period which has survived, something universal about, uh, well, obviously, in the particular case, about the impact of the magazine on the people who read it and that impact around the world. I mean, it's a lovely thing about if you ever went to the North Pole, if a Scotsman was there, the first thing he'd say is, can you get me some people's friends? Which I think is just lovely. You know, that's <laughs> that sort of thing. And at the time, you know, the North Pole, hardly anybody had been there. They, by 1904, they hadn't conquered the South Pole. So, you know, we're talking about a time yeah. period that could not be more different to ours. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because very early on in the People's Friend history, um, what we see is that it spreads all around the world. And, you know, there are stories um, in very early issues about people who have gone out to China, for example, as missionaries and taken the People's Friend with them. And letters yeah. eventually come back from all these different countries to the magazine talking about their experiences. So I love that it's captured in the song as well. And I also like what mm. you said about it being a time capsule, because I think a lot of the stories from the archives that we're going to talk about on on reading between the lines are also little time capsules from the archives that are so rich mm. in period information about how people lived their lives back then. Um, it, they're just a joy to hear. And I love that the song also reflects that same spirit. It must be what won it its prize. When you say they gave the prize to the lyrics first, yes. my feeling is, and I put my hand up to this, I had no idea the influence of The People's Friend as an international mm -hmm. magazine yeah. and the idea of appealing to Scots who weren't in Scotland. Yes. So that lovely sense of a kind of, it's another survivor, really, I think, that's carried in the song. So it, it, that was what I think I found most moving about it. Um, I, I think the song itself, and I'll put my hand up to this as well. My sight reading is truly, truly dreadful. I am the world's worst sight reader. I'm like most improvising pianists, except the ones from another planet, which is you can either play by ear or you can sight read. If you can do both, you are an extraterrestrial, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> up there with church organists who can play four manuals and a set of pedals <laughs> all at once. But th th when I read the music and recorded it. I recorded it in little sections so that I was playing exactly what was in the bars. And in there are little decorations, which again are very much of their time. Um, there's, there's a kind of, uh, let me see if I can, yeah. There's a little kind of run up partway through it, which sort of goes like this. Between the lyrics, which, if you were going to be arranging it for a bigger band, which obviously, I assume, never happened, 
then that is the, the pianist or the composer signaling with his piano score that the verse, this chorus starts with, you know, the good old people's friend, and then you would have the trumpet doing yup, up, 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 and in and on from there. So it, it's, <laughs> I can understand why it would be considered not very good. Some of the lyrics are a little bit long for the lines. There's a couple of places where you have to make a single syllable word go over three notes or a three syllable word go over one. You know, it's it's just the way it is. But the fact that it was written first, again, the lyrics are strong. They're nicely rhymed. They work fine. The music that's been brought to them is better than average. It's 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 a it's a fine workmanlike bit of composition on on the part of the composer, and putting in those little uh, sort of decorations from the piano also make it something that a pianist has got a chance to shine. That's the other thing about those kind of songs. In, a, in what we would think of as a kind of parlour experience where people are sitting around listening to a singer with a piano player behind them, you need to hear that both the singer and the piano player are being stretched. So that song does that rather than just giving you... In fact, it's got some quite tough left-hand stuff. This is another reason why I recorded it in sections because you've, you've got these kind of... Um, uh, my headphones are slightly in the way, but let me see if I can do this. This is just left hand, yes? So you've got that sort of feel. And you've got to keep that going while you're doing all the in the right. So it's not easy piano, uh, but it is recital piano accompanists music. Without any doubt, it's, it's that. And it does it does its job. That was fantastic. Thank you for playing that little bit, Neil. That's that's wonderful. Um, the next thing I was going to mention was that within um, the archives of The People's Friend, it's really, really noticeable in the early part of the 20th century, particularly, that they print sheet music routinely in the magazine ah. as part of what they did every week. Um, so this song, when it was um, matched up with its tune, did actually appear in the pages of The People's Friend. Um, along with lots of other sheet music, it's very noticeable. And uh, I think it must have been a thing at the time that people would sit around a piano or or some mm. sort of instrument and and play music as family entertainment um, is something that we've lost completely now, isn't it? It is, and it's quite something to think. I mean, I'm in my early sixties. I grew up in houses on a council estate in outside East London, where every house had got a piano. Every single house. It was like you wouldn't have a party without a piano. And even if these were, a lot of them, gronky old upright pianos that were, you know, hardly ever played. They were played from time to time. They might have been played by the kids. But that thing of communal music making was so important to communities. Um, I, I find it difficult myself, even with the sort of immersion that I've had in past years, to take on board just how normal it was for people to hear live music. But as part of their everyday lives, particularly in the Edwardian period, and I guess probably actually throughout the whole of the 20th century, the assumption was that if you had an event of some kind in your house or in a hall or whatever, there would be someone who could play the piano and quite usually someone who could sing. And either both would happen, or someone who could sing well would just start to sing. And this is not only about the fact that singing and playing was so natural to everybody, they'd grown up with it. It's also because they all knew the same songs. So as soon as somebody started singing a song, you would join in because you knew the words. Everybody knew the words, and everybody's uh, experience for the time that song went by was absolutely locked. It didn't matter if you had 2,000 people in a hall. Every single one of those people felt joined to everybody else. So the, the fact that the People's Friend put songs out there, and I would be fascinated to know from your archive folk whether these were 
traditional songs that they'd got music, you know, just some simple music, whether they were new songs, uh, whether going down the vulgar commercial route for a moment, these were songs they were going to make some money out of, whether they owned the rights to the songs that they were going out with the magazine. But also what kind of, what was it that bound all those songs together? What did the editor choose as a song to go with the magazine? Because that would be quite crucial in, in knowing how they expected those songs to be used and to be played. Uh, the other thing that strikes me, and I'm forgive me because I'm kind of mining my own memories here, but my memory of The People's Friend as a magazine is that it's quite large. So you could actually put the whole thing up on a piano, on a piano music stand, and just play what was there. So there will have been people who might have turned straight to that page, gone straight over to the piano and sat down, and, and if they were like me, tried to pick it out for an hour or so, or if they were good musicians, just read it and, poof, and gone. So it's it is very much a a part of, I think, a quality of life that the magazine yeah. was trying to put across. And I, I wonder, and I, I don't want to be sort of reductive here, I wonder if it was also a big awareness of how important singing was to Scots around the world, how important it was to to sing or play something new, if that's what it was, how important it was, if it was more traditional songs, how, how important it was to sing those. Um, so it does throw up a whole load of questions and fascinating questions about how the the magazine saw music making at the time. It feels like the topic for a whole new podcast series, doesn't it? The music of the people's friend. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of it being... Um, a performance as well as as a reading experience because I think when we've been uh, looking at some of the stories from the archives for reading between the lines what we've really noticed is that they read aloud so very very well and I think it's made us all think that yeah. perhaps they were designed to be read aloud around the the fire of an evening to the whole family instead of enjoyed as a more yeah. solitary pursuit which is what reading is today so it fascinates me how tastes have changed perhaps in the way that we use magazines as well um it's it's fascinating glimpse back into the past i think that that makes a lot of sense um and the i i wonder and forgive me because i haven't read one cover to cover did the people's friend theme from one issue to the next so did they have an overall theme for each issue which to which all the stories would then link uh, not specifically no just more of that tone which was hmm. um nostalgia for the past a deep love of scotland and and the people of scotland and just an affection for hmm. tradition and poetry and literature they, they were quite well read um the readers of the people's friend um in the past and you know literacy was something that was was prized and there were lots of um quite educational articles about other parts of the world and other um customs and uh, ways of life mm -hmm. so i think they were they were in the past certainly a, a curious um a information seeking bunch of people that that really loved their entertainment and their feelings of home and tradition mm. and um, yeah, I think music played into all of that. It was clearly important. I mean, it does amuse me to think that when this song was written, it, the People's Friend was only 36 years old. And the song is very much the dear old People's Friend. You know, it's play, paying tribute to its longevity. And I do wonder what they would have thought 152 <laughs> years on from its launch that, you know, it's still going strong. It um, does, does amuse me. <laughs> well, absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right. I think the magazine was intended to be the starting point for a whole load of communal activities. I think people were expected to read it aloud mm -hmm. and to read stories to other people. And as such, the the song would have been there to be heard as much as to be read. In fact, it couldn't have been read by anybody who wasn't a musician. Mm -hmm. But it's also interesting, bear in mind, all the houses that had a piano had have to have music as well. So actually the song is value added on the price of the magazine yes. because sheet music costs. Yeah. 
which yes. basically means that the people's friend bought the rights to that song to put it out to its readership and that readership didn't have to pay for the song they bought the magazine already so there's an element of that too that for your money you're not only getting excellent stories and all the the sort of uh, the, the 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 sentiment that you just expressed you're getting a song yeah. for free as well and as we know the cover price was a penny one old penny um for the first yeah. 50 years of the the magazine's life and then it went up to one penny halfpenny so um <laughs> i think they got a good deal didn't they yeah I think they got a very good deal for their penny. Um, it's <laughs> it's worth bearing in mind, I suppose, that 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 assumption as well of uh, the 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 way that they were going to use the magazine also meant that there was a there was a sort of a lifetime to it. It was worth collecting them. It was worth hanging on to them. It's worth hanging on to them because you got the song in there. It's worth hanging on to them because of a particular story. Um, I, again, I'm sorry to mind the cliche, but if I remember most of the people's friends I saw were in doctors' waiting mm -hmm. rooms and dentists' surgeries and all those sorts of places. So the assumption was that it was a magazine that everybody would like to read um, and irrespective of age or sex. Uh, so I think, again, there's, there's a very canny idea behind printing music in that magazine. Um, Later, I think it becomes much more de rigueur to have sheet music in magazines, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if The People's Friend wasn't one of the first to make a regular habit of printing sheet music as part of its, as part of, of what was on offer for your penny. It would be interesting to find out, wouldn't it? It does feel like there's a whole area of study there to be explored about music in magazines. I think so. I think so. Do you have a particular section of the music that, that you most enjoyed playing? Uh, not really. Um, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a jobbing composer and musician, and I know the bit that I enjoy the most is the bit that I find the least hard work. So the hardest work was putting the piano accompaniment together. Um, once I had that, putting the clarinet over it was an absolute joy because I'd already seen in putting the piano together how well it supported the clarinet playing the vocal line. So then being able to get the clarinet to kind of make the sound of a human voice across the top of the piano was just lovely. And you could sort of ride it and I could do eight bars or 16 bars at a time. And then uh, without anybody knowing until this podcast, go back and clean it up. <laughs> so that I put all my wrong notes in the right place, but that was that was the most fun bit. Um, but also, I think that the whole thing was far more of far more moving and far more uh, enjoyable than I have to say I entirely expected, because as it came together, I could hear this authenticity of of Edwardian music of, and not Edwardian. Uh, parlor or professional music, Edwardian community people's music. I mean, you know, it's it's nothing special, it's nothing posh, but it is representative of what most people would have liked in the way of music at the time. So when I started putting the clarinet in, it suddenly you were there. The piano was playing because I, I, I track the pieces so that I do the piano first and the, then, the, then the voice goes over the top of that. So then when you hear how it's working, when you're playing it yourself, um, it's, it's, it, it really was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, I, to give away another state secret, it's, it's, it's not a real clarinetist. It's me. Um, <laughs> but nowadays, again, as a, as a jobbing composer, you are in a position of having this extraordinary gift. Um, I don't mean a gift you own, but a gift you can buy of orchestral uh, instrumentalists playing in such a way that you can then pick up that music for yourself and play it on your keyboard. So I'm just going to play you a little bit of the clarinet on its own. And it sounds, I don't know if I've got it up high enough volume wise. Let's just see. Yes, that should be all right. It sounds like this.
Now, that would take quite a good clarinet player to get you that. Mm -hmm. And it's got a little bit of life to it. So as soon as you have that, it's one of the things that inspires me as a composer. Um, it's like I've got a room full of the greatest musicians and I can open the door and go, actually, I really need a clarinet player at this point. And one of the best clarinetists comes out, <laughs> puts the instrument in his mouth and starts playing. <laughs> Technology is wonderful, isn't it, in many ways? I couldn't have put your song back together again without it. Uh, uh, in fact, coming completely clean, I couldn't have become a composer without it. Mm. I had no musical qualifications. Uh, I had grade five, grade six piano, which I'm sure many of your listeners have got. Uh, and then that was it until about, until a couple of years ago, I was made a visiting professor of the Royal Academy of Music. And I've got to be still possibly the least qualified <laughs> professor of music at the Royal Academy they've ever had. And yet music has been your passion, hasn't it, for, for many, many years. So I think you're probably doing yourself down a bit there. <laughs> I was, I, it, it always was central to what I did and what I thought for the simple reason that I was not the world's most confident child, but the one thing I knew I could do was play the piano by ear. So I could play, I could just sit down at the piano and I could play something I'd heard, heard in the cinema, for instance, or I could just make up tunes. And I became far more interested in that than I did in the music I was supposed to be playing, which was Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven. So as my life went on and I studied drama at university and they said, oh, well, you're a musician as well. Can you come and do some music for us? So the piano and playing and particularly playing things people recognized and that they didn't expect, like film music, TV music, um, theatre things, musicals. I relied on that more and more and more. It then became a job because I'm a silent film pianist. It then became another job because I do TV programmes about music from which I sit at the piano. I could no more have predicted that all this would come about because I could play the piano by ear than I could fly to the moon. But that's where it's come from, is a deep sense of responsibility in a funny sort of way because my playing by ear was a complete gift. I could do it when I was seven and for the first 10 or 20 years I was trying to make my way in the profession I was deeply guilty about the fact that I had no musical qualifications much and the one qualification I did have I'd been born with. So I, I, I was struggling to kind of make up the time and the, uh, and, and the sense of inadequacy. That, thankfully, is not so much the case now. <laughs> but do you know, I think that actually makes you the ideal person for this project because most of the people who read this song and, and saw it in The People's Friend in 1905 would not have had any formal musical qualifications. They wouldn't have had music lessons. No. They would have been mainly working class people who spent their hard end penny on The People's Friend and got maximum entertainment out of it. And they would have just as you've said, played piano because they loved it and because they could hear the tunes and because they wanted to entertain their families. So I, th I think it's a great fit. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, I must say. Um, and my hope is uh, that there are much younger people than me coming up who also would find it fascinating. Um, I, I'm very aware now of a kind of gulf between my life experience, particularly when I was younger, to the life experience of kids growing up now. And, you know, when you know that the Beatles are history, as far as most people are concerned, let alone 1904, I just hope there are people who, youngsters, who will see this or hear it or read about it or whatever, and will have a similar curiosity and who will say, yeah, I really want to know more about that. I hope there are those who are going to go into Edwardian music and find out what it was about as historiography, but also as a kind of awareness of their own timelines, 
you know, this is the other thing I've been aware of with working with films that are 100 years old. It's still about us. This isn't a foreign country that we don't bear any resemblance to. This is what our grandparents and great parents and great great grandparents read and heard and watched and played and sang. So if we want to know more about us, it would be really useful to know a lot more about them. Yeah, it's a real window into the past, isn't it? I think, Neil, that you know, you've been absolutely brilliant. You've given such an insight into everything that that um you you've experienced with recording this tune. But would you mind if we finished up by asking you to play a little snatch of the tune as a preview for anybody that might be um encouraged to go and listen to reading Certainly. between the lines after hearing this? Thank you. <laughs> Certainly. Um what I'll do is rather than actually playing it myself at the piano, which as I've, for all the reasons I've just told you, will sound awful. I'll play a little bit of just the piano without the clarinet, just so that you can hear how lovely and intricate this piano is. into the chorus slowly and jump. If that isn't distilled Edwardianism, I don't know what is. Well, Neil, thank you so much for that. It has been absolutely fascinating talking to you and finding out how you recreated our wonderful Dear Old People's Friend song. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs>